folks. Uh, thank you for all coming out tonight. Bible study and prayer time. Uh, the speaker tonight is Stephen Walker. Stephen, you're very welcome. We look forward to what the Lord has given to you for us. Just before we start uh, an opening prayer, I just want to remind you about Ken's exhibition. Nancy and I and the twins were down today. It was, it was good. There's still plenty of paintings. A few, a few. So there was even two more sold after yeah. that gone. Uh, what I loved about there was one that was the big one. You know that lovely one. Oh yeah, the road. Uh, and it was the broad road and the narrow road. It was two roads on the painting, and there was a broad road and a narrow road, and that has given Kenna an opportunity to bring the, the gospel out of that. So it's been amazing. So it's. It finishes on Saturday, the 9th, uh, and it's from 10 to 5. And as I reminded you, you don't have to pay a thing unless you go out to see the ducks. If you go to see the ducks, it costs you. Uh, it's but amazing because it costs them as well. Hmm? It costs us about a pay thing. Yeah. Co- yeah. <coughs> uh, there's no special offers of buy one, get one free or anything like that. <laughs> they go as low as £10, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. And as Ken told me today, when he pops his clogs, it could be worth a fortune. Well, I've been told that. Yeah. <laughs> the top so it could be the best £10 you invest for many, many years. So, OK, let's just open in prayer. Lord, we just thank you again for this opportunity to be together. Lord, we thank you that as we meet here, your word says that where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. Lord, we just praise and thank you. We praise and thank you for our salvation. But Lord, we also praise and thank you for your keeping hand upon us (coughs) as we walk this life. So Lord, just be with us. And be with Stephen now as he brings your word and pray that you will continue to bless, guide and undertake with him. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good evening. It is good to be here. This is the first time that I've had the privilege of ministering God's word here in Cumber Baptist. I was asked to come previously when Clifford Morrison was here looking after you, but unfortunately the date he gave me I was booked up for to go somewhere else and it didn't work out. So, And he didn't get back to me again, so I don't know whether he was offended or not, but we have known Clifford for a while. Um, I met Neil, your pastor, When I was studying at the Baptist College, I was in the year above Neil. I was one of the first of the preparation for ministry course, and Neil came in the year behind. But at that time, Neil's pastor, or Neil's uncle, was my pastor in Lisburn Congregational, Harry Ray. Some of you might know Harry. He was my pastor in Lisburn Congregational Church, and then I was in the Bible College. I'm now a member of your sister church, Lisburn Baptist, having served the Lord for five years in full-time ministry in Ballon Hinch, and then five years also in Scotland, in an independent evangelical church there, having to give that up and come home because my father-in-law had taken ill and my wife was back and forward, and it just wasn't feasible, her being an only child. So we had to give that up. Still doing a lot of preaching here, there and everywhere, waiting to see what the Lord has. If somewhere will open, we're trusting him. But in the meantime, I've got a job. I'm working making cardboard boxes in a place called Smurfit Kappa and getting good opportunities there to witness for the Lord. Everybody knows you're a Christian. It was funny, after about three days in the place, people came and asked, you know, what did you work at before you came here? Well... For the last 12 years, there was a minister in a church, poked the ground, there was nobody in sight. They all run away, but gradually they started to come back, and you do get opportunities daily to witness for the Lord. And 
you don't have to go looking for them. They come asking questions. And conversations can go on for days, for weeks. Um, it's a great opportunity, and I have to say, the Lord is using me there just as a witness and to an influence, a Christian influence for him. So we just pray that the Lord will continue to use me there if he doesn't open the door to go back to full-time ministry. Tonight we're turning to the New Testament. We're turning to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter. And we're going to read from the first nine verses of chapter 1. 1 Peter in chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse 1, and I'm always reminded from something I heard at a conference a few years ago that each time we open the Word of God to read the Word of God, that we have to remember that this is the Word of Truth. The man, Steve Lawson, said that this is the only part of our service for which we can claim infallibility. Everything else that's said and done may it be a hymn sang, the thoughts of the, the, the pastor. They're the thoughts of men, really. But this is the word of the true and the living God. So let's hear the word of God to our hearts this evening. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfailing, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for our salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by furious trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy in the inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Amen. And we know that God will bless this reading of his word to our hearts. And in these verses, Peter is calling us to bless and to praise God. He's asking us, or he's telling us, that we should be praising God, we should be blessing God for our eternal salvation. And he makes a, a wonderful statement regarding this salvation by calling it our inheritance in verse 4. And then he defines this inheritance for us as a salvation ready to be revealed in verse 5. And maybe some of you are immediately thinking, but I've got my salvation. I'm saved and I, I know I am. And yes, you have. And yes, you are. But the full perfection that comes with salvation has not yet been reached. It's like the little chorus says, He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. And friends, the good news, or maybe I should say the great news, 
is that he will continue this work until we reach heaven's glory. For then and only then will we be perfected. Only then will we see the the fullness of our salvation revealed. Because that is when we will receive our inheritance. The inheritance that Peter is speaking of here in these verses. And Paul, he confirms these, these things for us in Philippians 1 and 6 when he writes, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. This future perfection, this inheritance is promised to us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that's the reason why as we gather here tonight, And as we go through this Christian life, that's the reason why we should be praising God continually. And sure, that's why we've come, isn't it? That's why we're here. We're here to praise and to thank God for what he has done for us. We've not come to worship and praise God because of the salvation that we have received. We're here to praise him for what he is doing, for what he is working out in and through us every day. And there is no doubting the truth that God has done and is doing so much for us. We can't deny that. And so Peter here is giving us just a little taste, a little sample of what we are going to spend all of eternity doing. And that is praising God for our salvation. That's what we're going to spend eternity doing. We're going to be continually praising him for what he has done for us through his son. And Peter outlines four elements of this inheritance for which we are to be eternally thankful. And the first thing that I want us to notice from the passage tonight is the source, the source of our inheritance. You know, we as a family, we joke about the inheritance that we will receive when my dad passes on. I, the standard joke is that I know where the little tin's hidden. I know what rosebush it's underneath. And my two sisters go, Yeah, that's the empty one. (laughs) But yet, that's the standard joke in our house when when we all get together. If I'm sitting beside my dad, I'll say, here he is, the man that's going to look after me as a son and heir. And so the joke is that my dad is the source of my inheritance. I'm not expecting too much, to be quite honest. But we'll get enough to do us anyway, won't we? But here we have... Peter telling us about the source of our inheritance. And if we look there at verse 3, we're told that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the source of our salvation, the source of this inheritance that we will receive is none other than the true and the living God. The God who revealed himself through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who came to be our sin sacrifice, the one who was our our (coughs) substitute, our, our advocate, our propitiation, the one who paid our ransom. And what Peter means here is the salvation which we have received, he gave it to us. Peter tells us that we are elect. We have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And he he reminds us that we are what we are in Christ because God, as a source of our salvation, 
has chosen us. He is the source of our inheritance, not we ourselves. God, in his love, in his sovereignty, has chosen us who believe in the finished work of his Son to be the recipients of eternal life. We could say, praise be to his name tonight for what he has done. You see, he is the source of our inheritance. Without him, there would be no inheritance. But why? Why did he do it? Why did he send his son to be our substitute? Why did he take time to choose you and to choose me out of all the people in this world? Why did he do it? Well, that just encourages them to move on and to think about that as we we look at our second little point, the, the motive of our inheritance. We've had the source, the Lord Jesus Christ, or the, the Father and, and Christ t- uh, two together. But look here in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So what was the motive for our salvation? Well, we're told here that it was his great mercy. We are saved tonight. We're born again tonight because God has this attribute called mercy. And you know, Titus 3 and 5 tells us that he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. He did it through his mercy. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, they say the same thing. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And so we're thankful tonight that the eternal God has this Amazing attribute of mercy. And so we should be. Because each and every one of us needed someone to show mercy towards us. Because we were in the pit, a pitiful condition. As sinners we've heard about the painting with the, the broad road and the narrow road. Well, we were all on that broad road that leads away from God and leads to hell and to destruction. But because of God's attribute of mercy, well, we're walking that narrow road tonight. And we're walking the road that will lead to heaven and to home. You see, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is a message of mercy. It's a message of mercy. You see, the the gospel is all about God's compassion towards a people who are in a miserable condition. The gospel is about God's compassion for lost sinners. And each one of us, before we received God's amazing mercy, we were lost in our sin and we were damned to hell. And in that condition, that pitiful condition, we needed God's mercy, didn't we? And we received this gift of mercy because of God's compassionate concern for us. Can you imagine, just for a moment, that God looked out into history He looked at you and he looked at me. And friends, I know me. I know me. I know what I'm like. But yet God saw me and he wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. You see, for some unexplainable reason, 
this holy God had compassion upon me, a sinner. He had compassion upon you who were dead in sin. Isn't that amazing? It's wonderful, isn't it? To think that God, this thrice holy, perfect God, looked at sinners like you and me and poured out mercy upon us. Instead of condemning us to an endless eternity, separated from him in hell, he says, no, I want them to be with me in heaven for all eternity. And there wasn't anything in you, there wasn't anything in me that was, that that even the minutest part desirable to God. It's just that this God is compassionate. He's merciful. And he bestows that, that mercy upon whomsoever he wills. And in Romans 9, He says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Thomas Watson, the old Puritan, said, It is God's mercy that sweetens all of his other attributes. In his compassion, he has chosen to be merciful to to us and to grant us eternal mercy salvation he is the source of our salvation and he has given it to us out of his mercy not out of anything that we did or we deserved and in second corinthians 1 and 3 paul calls him god the father of mercies It is through his mercy that he has given us this wonderful inheritance. The source of our inheritance is God. The motive of our inheritance is his mercy. And the third thing we see is the means of our inheritance. You see, if God is the source and mercy is his motive, How then do we receive it? Well, Peter says that the means by which we receive the mercy of God, which gives us the eternal inheritance, is the new birth. The new birth which comes to us through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look again at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is this fact that we are born again to a living hope. It's through the resurrection that makes the difference in our lives. This new birth, well, it changes us, doesn't it? It makes us a new creation. It gives us a new perspective. There's none of us who thinks the same, speaks the same, nor hopes for the same things that we did before we came to Christ. You know, I was 38 when I was born again. I used to hope every Saturday night that my numbers would come up on the lottery. We had a syndicate and work that everybody paid into, and I always picked certain numbers as well, hoping upon hoping to win the lottery. And you know what? When I was born again, money didn't matter because my father now owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's richer beyond measure. 
and I don't need the inheritance that my dad has hid below the rose bush because I'm getting a great inheritance whenever my father calls me home. You see, we have a different outlook, a different perspective because we are born again. We have received this new life. But what does Peter mean by this living hope? Well, he means that we have a hope that is continually alive. We have a hope that will never diminish. That pen below the rose bush that I keep mentioning, well, it could rot away. And all the 50 pences inside it could disappear into the ground and be lost forever. But the inheritance in heaven never diminish. It's safe and it's secure. You see, Peter means if we are hoping in something other than the Lord Jesus Christ, then our hope is a dead or a dying hope. And we all know those who are in the world who only know dying hopes. Isn't that right? No, at best, all the hopes and dreams of men will die when they die. But as Christians, we have an undying hope. We have a living hope. We have a hope that will come to a glorious, eternal fulfillment. You know, Peter tells us in his second letter, in chapter 3 and verse 13, that according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And that's our hope tonight, isn't it? That is the hope that sustains us. It's a hope that God in his mercy and grace will fulfill. And it is the assurance of this fulfillment that caused Paul to say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know, how can it be again to die? How can it be again to die? Well, for us as believers, it is again to die. Because when we die in Christ, this hope becomes reality. Because there's coming a day when we will see our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, as he is. We will see him with the nail prints on his hands and his feet. We'll see him with that pierced side. And we will be able to praise and thank him for what he has done for us. You see, in death, we get the glorious sight of Christ. The sight of God. And we get unhindered fellowship with our Savior. To die is gain for the Christian because then we have that we are in that state of perfection, of eternal holiness and the eternal freedom from sin. What a hope What a hope Christ has given to us. What hope we have tonight. Look back at verse 3. That it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead that made it all possible. The means then of our receiving this inheritance is the new birth received through faith in the resurrection of Christ. Our inheritance has, as its source, God, as its motive, 
God's mercy. And as its means, the new birth. And that brings us to our final thought. The security of our inheritance. You know, as I've said, those 50 P's in that 10 might disappear. But there's security in the inheritance of God. Look at verse 4. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfailing, kept in heaven for you. And this should bring (coughs) real joy to our hearts. Because we're being told that our inheritance is incorruptible. We're told that it will never be defiled. It will never fade away as things that we inherit in this world do. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus had in mind in Matthew 6 and verses 19 to 21 when he said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The treasure that God has given to us through the eternal inheritance of salvation will never be stolen. It will never be moth-eaten. It will never be tarnished by rust. You know, everything that we have in this life is corrupted. Our cars, as much as some of us love them, well, they will rust. Our houses that we treasure, well, they will grow old and they will decay. And even the money that you may have put away in the bank or under the mattress, Well, we've seen it so recently, haven't we? That the money is a victim of the shifting economy. That's why we are to store up our treasures in heaven. Because in heaven, they are safe. In heaven, they are kept. In heaven, they will never decay. Because in heaven, they are sinless. And they are eternal. Tonight, Peter wants us to enjoy this inheritance without any fear whatsoever. And so to encourage us further, he tells us in verse 4, <coughs> oh, pardon me, it is kept in heaven you. The King James Version says, reserved in heaven for you. And if you reserve a table in a restaurant, well, the table's kept, isn't it? It's kept until you arrive. And your heavenly inheritance is being kept until you arrive. It's being kept until you're called home to receive it. And that's what Peter is saying to us. Our inheritance is being guarded in heaven. And the idea here is that our already existing inheritance is under guard in heaven. God has promised us this inheritance. And he tells us here that it is kept in a safe place awaiting us. You see, it's in a place where moth and rust cannot destroy. It's in a place where thieves will never break in and steal. And in Revelation 21, 27, we read this about heaven. But nothing unclean will ever enter it nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, 
but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Our inheritance tonight is safe. It's secure. Because no one is going to break into heaven and steal it away. Not Satan, nor any of his demons. Nobody. Heaven will never know an invasion. Heaven will never know an invasion. Heaven will never know any spoiling of its treasures. Heaven will never know any defacing of its beauty. Heaven will never have any armies tramping into it to fight against its inhabitants. Heaven will never be invaded. And so, are we praising God tonight? The God who saved us when we didn't deserve it? Are we praising God tonight? Are we praising God who who granted to us through the new birth this eternal salvation which is reserved in heaven and cannot be taken from us? As we serve the true and the living God each and every day, surely we must be praising him. Surely we must be living lives of praise. Lives of obedience. Taking God at his word. Claiming his every promise. As we seek to do his will for him. You see, as we live for God in this world, we can go out day by day in complete confidence because nobody can steal our treasures from us. Oh, they might break into your house and take your your fancy TV or your your jewellery or whatever. They might even steal your car out of a car park whatever your worldly treasures are, but no one can ever take away your heavenly treasure. Those treasures that you've built up over years and years through service for the Lord. Nobody can disqualify you from receiving the inheritance that God has set aside for you. See, look there at verse 5 who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That ultimate inheritance, that perfection that we all strive for, it will come. We just need to be patient. We need to wait. Because in the perfect time, in God's perfect plan we will receive it it is ours it's being kept for us no one else is going to get it it's there awaiting our return to home you see our continued faith in God and in Christ is the evidence of God's keeping work when God saved us He ignited faith within us and he keeps us continually energized. He keeps energizing our faith, the faith that protects and preserves us. God has given us an eternal inheritance. May we be continually praising him. Not just for what he has done, but also for what he is doing in the here and now. And that's praising for what he will do for us in the future when we are with him for all eternity. We have a bright hope tonight, don't we, friends? We have a hope that we will be with Christ, which is far better for us truly to live as Christ 
to die is gain. Because our gain is our great inheritance. And it is an eternity with Christ himself in heaven's glory. May God bless these thoughts to our hearts this evening. Amen. Amen. Amen.